Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is the uh, final event of day three here at the Methane Pavilion at COP26. And this is actually, I think, uh, really one of the highlights of today. Uh, I'm joined here by Ryan Panchacharam. Yeah? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. So good to be here. Uh, and Ryan, uh, um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an intro to who Ryan is, and you'll, you'll see why this is going to be such an exciting event. He's here to talk about a book that he wrote with John Doerr mm -hmm. called Speed and Scale, which is very much about how do you take big, thorny challenges, like the one we now have in meeting the terms of this new methane pledge that all these countries have taken, Right? And how do you break that down into actionable steps that can lead to real results? And just so that you all know, Ryan is both uh, a, an engineer and an investor at Kleiner Perkins. Uh, and so he's got a lot of familiarity with how you take really great ideas and bring them to scale and bring them to market and bring them to fruition. So Ryan, I'm really glad that you took the time to come and always, talk with us. Always, methane's huge. So. We have to talk about methane, but we also have to talk about setting great goals, too. So, yeah. talking about great goals. So, so, you all came up with this book. Yes. Speed and Scale, which is, which, is, which is really about how you break the climate problem down, right? Absolutely. And turn it into things that you can do, things that you can take action on. Why don't you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, of course. It? So, the book is called Speed and Scale. It started with a conversation with John about how do you take the 59 gigatons of emissions and put them, uh, well one, draw them down, but apply OKRs to them. And so for folks that aren't familiar, OKRs stand for Objectives and Key Results. It's a goal setting system used by Google, the Gates Foundation, and many other startups. The whole idea behind it is you set a goal with measurable key results, and you are higher, the, the likelihood of you achieving them goes up, right? Because not only you're setting an aspirational thing, you're setting what actually does it mean to be successful around it. So about two years ago, the question was, could we apply OKRs to the climate crisis? It wasn't to set out to write a book, it was really to ask, could we apply OKRs to the climate crisis? And then unfortunately, COVID started. So because of COVID, uh, we couldn't go see people, so we did a bunch of Zoom meetings, Zoom meetings with folks like yourself and a whole bunch of your colleagues at EDF, just to understand the problem. And because the record button wasn't too far away on Zoom, we ended up recording a bunch of these conversations. And by the time we got to like conversation 30 or 40, we're like, we're learning a ton. These stories that folks like you, Mark, and Steve, and Margo from EDF are sharing are really what inspire people. So what if we put a book together that has the objectives and key results, inspirational stories from leaders that are entrepreneurs, as well as policy makers, as well as movement makers, and um, Hopefully it can help. It can help us move quicker and faster. Well, I certainly know from the, from the work that we've done with you and, and doing those conversations, I know we learned a lot, and it really has helped shape how we structure our own work at, e, at EDF. So uh, we have gotten a lot out of the process, your process, so thank you. Um, but maybe give folks an example of what an OKR is. Of course. Yeah, so um, in the book, there's this poster, you know, we figured, can we fit everything on a page? And we kind of cheated. It's uh, not just a page, it's a, it's a really large page. But <laughs> the, the idea is quite simple of what the solutions we have to go after. And what's kind of neat is these things that one through five, and I'll show you number six, they look really familiar because they're the things that we all know are causing the emissions. We've got to electrify transportation. We've got to find ways to decarbonize the grid, get gas out of buildings, fix methane leaks. We've got to fix our food system as well too, right? These are just clear objectives of what we have to get done. We then have to clean up, sorry, protect nature, ending deforestation. We've got to clean up industry. And then, because when you look at all the numbers, whether they're ours or someone else's, there's still going to be anywhere between five to 10 gigatons of emissions that are still in the atmosphere. Right, right, right. So we got to find a way to remove that using nature or engineered methods. So that's one part of the book. The other part are the accelerants. And you know, John and I are engineers, we are techies, we come from the valley, but we do not put technology on a pedestal. There are four equal levers that we can pull. We got to win the policy and politics, right? Nothing happens without those commitments. It's why we're here today at, at COP. We then have to turn the movements that are happening into action. This is everything from the youth movement all the way to movements that Larry Fink and others are doing. We then have to find ways to innovate. And truly innovation, the success of it is around cost. 
And then the last thing is we got to invest because without money going towards the problem, we're never going to see the switch over. And so the plan mark is these 10 objectives and then there are 55 key results that show are we there yet. So the, and, the, and the key results really help you take each one of these very important objectives and just kind of break it down into Absolutely. tangible things, right? And, and, and I'll pick on two of them. So okay. for electrified transportation, right? If we do that, we will successfully draw down six gigatons of emissions. But we got two key results to sort of show us if we're making progress. And so there's one key result that says electric cars have to meet the cost parity with fossil fuel vehicles by 2024. There's another objective that says by 2025, we're only going to sell electric buses. And so if we get to 2024 and electric vehicles are still more expensive, or we're still seeing diesel buses sold and you know, driving around on the street, in 2025, we know we're not making the progress we need to, right? So these are early warning indicators that say we've got to get back on track. I see. And, and, and basically for each one of those then, you have a set of accelerants, right, that can, totally. be, that can be applied to that, that, that particular objective. A absolutely. So these are in many ways the outputs, right, getting people into electric vehicles, us switching to different cleaner forms of heat. On the uh, lever side, well, we've got a KR around the cost of batteries the cost of green hydrogen, right? If we don't actually hit those cost targets, we're never going to see these things deployed. You know, what, what I think one of the exciting things at COP is this yeah. energy around more project finance, energy around deployment, energy around actually more money going to the uh, developing world, which we have to meet those commitments. Sure. But those dollars are not going to go towards the green technologies that are still proving themselves, right? Like the green premium that Bill Gates talks about. And so on the innovation side, when those costs fall below, right, it doesn't become a premium anymore and green becomes truly a discount, like it is in solar and wind, you're going to see market forces just go completely behind So them. I understand, you know, as, 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 as an investor, helping to coach companies to success, I understand how you yeah. would use this to help them structure their thought process and, and for you to know whether they're really making progress completely. towards commercialization. If you were someone in, in government or mm. public policy, right, how would you think about using this model to advance your objectives as, as a policymaker? Oh yeah, of course, it's a good, good analogy, right? This comes from the, the, you know, put in quotes, the business world, right? Let's set an objective to be the world's fastest browser if you're Google and you set these KRs, yeah. but it can be used anywhere. In the policy setting, I think the real question to ask is what are we trying to accomplish, right? What is this policy trying to do in the next year, in the next five years? And then let's set some key results that say that we're successful or not. Right, a lot of policy gets passed today that is really announcement oriented, gets people excited, and then you kind of tuck it away and you never know, well, all that intention behind it, did it actually happen, right? And so in the sense of climate policies, we've got to not only say what we're trying to do, like get gas out of buildings or create a renewable portfolio that's 100%, we also should set some KRs, like, well, if you want to get gas out of buildings, we probably should update the building code. And if that happens or doesn't happen, that's you know, a success metric. Well, I know in, in, in our case, in EDF, yeah. right? I mean, when we've thought about how you get after this issue of global methane, we've, we've set the goal for ourselves mm -hmm. of a 45% reduction in oil and gas methane emissions by 2025, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And so that becomes kind of our organizing objective. And then we think about some of the key metrics or key measures. One of them, frankly, is to make sure that methane is on the agenda at, in the international agenda at COP. And? and so here we are, <laughs> right? And so that has really helped us, you know, kind of break down what seems to, at first to be a very complicated and overwhelming problem is. into things that you can, you can sort of roadmap. And, and one of the things you talk about there, right, the poly, like as an organization, a lot of us may represent nonprofits or advocacy groups. And what's kind of really special about this is yeah. we set uh, you know, audacious goals like at COP, there's going to be a commitment around methane. But for all of us, we're not part of the COP process, right? The work we do is putting together research, writing papers, you know, putting ads, doing a lot of the hard work. We can set goals around those, right? Those are the inputs into the things with the hope that one day at COP, they'll make an announcement like this. And so your team has done so much work behind this around collecting data, doing the hard work of research. And like when you think about the goals that we're setting back at home, it should be those things. And if we do them, we believe it's going to make, you know, this action at COP happen. So there's so much, 
work ahead, mm -hmm. right now that you have over 100 companies that have committed to a 30% 30 30 reduction, 30. right? 30 by 30, so yeah. there, that's your right? That's your prime objective. Yes. And then be able to now break that down. Maybe you have one goal for oil and gas, mm -hmm. and you have one goal for agriculture, and you have another goal for landfills, and then you break that further down. Is that, that that's basically Com the idea, right? Completely, and the neat part about, so 30 by 30, we all get very excited, but what does it mean? Right. You know, and when you pick it apart, I, I love the oil and gas one, because that's like such a, tangible one we can tackle, right? From the latest IEA report, 75% of those wells can be capped with no additional like hit on there. Like it doesn't cost them most much. Most of them can't. Yeah. Most of this can be achieved with no net cost industry. Exactly. That's right. that. And, That's and what's right. neat about that is then we can set that goal, right? If they can do it, it is an additional cost. Let's set a key result that says in the next five years, have them cap those wells, right? The cost shouldn't be an issue. This is about goal setting and then holding people accountable. And, and by the way, because methane is such a big issue, that is only a third of the piece of the puzzle, which gets me kind of curious. I know I'm throwing it a little bit back to you, but that's like one really solid KR. What are some good ones for landfills as well as, you know, agriculture, like from your team's point of view, what are some good goals around those? Well, we're beginning to think about how you begin to break down the agriculture problem into livestock mm -hmm. and rice farming. And then from livestock, you think about, well, there's dairy and then there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's beef cattle. Yes. And you think about the differing circumstances. So you might have one goal that would apply to say, um, you know, large-scale agriculture, sort of corporate-sized, industrial-sized agriculture, and you might have another that is more oriented towards rural, rural totally communities and rural economic development. You have to. They're different they're kinds different, of solutions. Different, different solutions. Yeah. And 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 in fact, I think with agriculture, yeah. you really have to be sensitive to cultural context. You do. What's What's neat about whenever you set these kind of like really precise data-driven goals, you're like, oh shoot, we actually, in a you know, in a tiny little sentence or even just a bullet, you're like, oh that actually doesn't apply to the developing world. It's different for the wealthier countries. And you get to break it down one more layer. In, you know, in the speed and scale OKRs, we're very adamant that countries like the US, Europe, and even China have to lead. We have to go first in this effort to decarbonize. But there is a note that says, for the developing world in countries where energy is still scarce, they need to get time. right? But then we, of course, follow up with the next paragraph, which goes, but <laughs> just remember the cost of solar, wind, and renewable energy is so low, so don't go down the path that we did in the West, which was build gas plants and coal plants for you know, ends and end, but invest in the right thing, leapfrog. And so I, I love this goal setting tool around OKRs. You'll see it in the book, but I want everybody here actually to take it home with them because it really lets you put in on the paper, on like an index card, what are we trying to accomplish? And it can really rally your teams behind some pretty amazing things. So Ryan, this is pretty, pretty interesting and amazing stuff. I want, to, I want to take the conversation in a slightly different direction. Of course. Um, you have talked about the fact that, that tackling climate change, okay, we know it as a policy challenge. We know it as a, you know, as a, as a challenge to the way we currently do business, but you've often talked about it as the economic opportunity of a lifetime. Yes. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, the, the one good, or one neat trend that's happening, this ocean wave of jobs, jobs, jobs. Right. Right, like this clean energy transition is going to create them. And so, um, that's a motivator, right? When you look at the latest IEA kind of numbers, right, we're gonna see a net of 25 million new jobs in this decade, right? 35 million added, a lot in actually creating renewable energy and storage, a lot in the services. You will lose that 5 million jobs in the fossil fuel industry, but we're creating more in the process. But not just that, I always like to see and, and think, you know, 59, what is it, 59 billion tons of emissions in the book, we really point to the UN number, which includes the land use change piece, but the 59 billion tons are somebody else's business model, right? That's someone burning oil, someone moving something around, someone growing something. And so those 59 billion gig, sorry, 59 billion tons 
are an economic opportunity, right, for the cleaner alternative to come. So you look at the, you know, 20 plus gigatons in energy, someone else can create an incredible business behind it. And do you see that same same kind of opportunity in, say, agriculture and food systems? I, I, I mean, uh, it's more obvious in the energy yeah. transportation sectors. It becomes more obvious if we can drive the cost down in steel and concrete. Right. In the agriculture rural space, what, what's kind of neat is you're seeing the opportunity in the alternative, right? You're seeing folks do better management of soil practices, which is creating richer soil, which means better yields. And so that the alternative is becoming more Getting profitable. Great, greater, get a greater efficiency for every unit of effort you put into That's growing. right. And yeah. then from a marketing point of view as well too, like doing the cleaner, the less intensive meat choices, right? I include plant-based in that, chicken, fish, and others. When you're able to claim those as benefits, people start to switch. You know, Beyond Meat opened up people's eyes to that plant-based stuff can taste good. Most of the people that eat Beyond Meat are meat eaters. You know, it isn't a fad for those of us that choose to be vegetarian or vegan. It really is meant for meat eaters to go, oh, if I eat beef two times a week, I'm only doing it once. And when you look at the numbers, that small behavior change adds does up. Yeah. add up, right? Instead of beef and lamb, pick something better. And then, you know, one, yeah, I'm preaching to the choir though. No, it's, an, it's, it, no it's great stuff. Is there anything as you scan the horizon, maybe this is, you're, you'll, you'll give us some investment tips here, but is, <laughs> as, you, as you scan the horizon, are there any sets of technologies, any, anything on the horizon that you are particularly mm. excited about? Yeah. Um, what's kind of neat is like when you break down each set of gigatons, like that's, those are where the business opportunities are. And so when you look at venture capital, um, when Paris was signed uh, and everyone came together for that here, there's only about $3 billion of venture capital going out to clean tech companies. There was still this feeling that clean neuro technology wasn't a successful thing to invest behind. And of course that story has changed in the past two to three years. You have Beyond Meat, you have Tesla, you have Sunrun, you have Enphase. Like you can list the number of companies that are worth billions of dollars, which means there are investors flocking and so your question was, where are some of the newer kinds of yeah, pieces? Yeah, what's, what's, what's catching your yeah. eye these days? These days, you're seeing a lot of investments in energy, right? A lot of gigatons there. You're seeing a lot of investment in transportation. And really, because of a lot of the plant-based momentum, you're seeing really good stuff in agriculture, like finding ways to not have to rely on cows and lamb and other you know, really intensive uh, farming uh, uh, animals, right? Um, I know that we've seen, you know, we've seen a tremendous uptick in information technologies coming yeah. into the marketplace, right? From the earliest field studies that we did on methane to today, it's just been an explosion of, you know, technologies for remote sensing, yes, 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 yes. for aircraft, for drones, for satellites. We're doing satellites. Many people are doing satellite technology. I think that in some ways the innovation is not just about, you know, if you will, the oh, hardware. Totally. Is... It's giving us greater information that allows us to do better problem solving Completely. quicker. Completely. It's creating transparency. But I realize where I was taking that five, three billion dollars in Paris point, Today, this year, it is looking like that number is going to be 30 billion. Yeah. So just from Paris to now, there's that 10x leap in investments. And it is because of these success stories. It's because people are seeing truly, oh, that's right. It takes more persistence. It takes more guts. It takes a lot more to build these companies. But if they're successful, some really good things can happen. And then to the point around drones and satellites and that category of innovation, the really neat part there is that that's transparency. I think the thing that EDF has done since 2010, really 2012 more publicly around methane is educate, educate, educate. And I think you know, what we've seen this past week is a, is a sign of success there, but I think what you've been announcing and hammering home with why we need something like methane sat is so important. Right, we can't hide for the, from the impacts of methane, especially I'm going to be like over indexing on the oil and gas industry because it's like you can actually go after and solve it. You just got to find the bad actors. You find the bad actors, they can you know, do something to clean it up. I used to, uh, before working at Kleiner Perkins, I was in the White House in the Obama administration doing a lot of work on transparency, on open data. And our big theory is like with a little bit of sunshine, or I think how the saying goes, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And so the work that you do on sharing that first methane is as bad as it is, that is a uh, 
a, a moment of transparency for the world to go, oh shoot, I've got to pay attention. But I think with what's going to happen, I keep pointing this way, by the way, there's a big picture of the satellite <laughs> in this direction. Like with that, you, you're not only saying it's a problem, but you're saying it's a problem right there. Well, and, and, and what you can't hide from it when you can point to where it, you know, exactly no, is. No, and, and what we're and what frankly, and what we're finding is is that when you get that information into the hands of policymakers, when you get that information into the hands of civil society, and candidly, when you get that information into the hands of companies, yep. right? Yep. You begin to see change happen, and the number of companies who, you know, say that they were not aware, yeah, right, until we actually started doing our field work, and actually now are coming to us and saying, hey, how'd you do that? What yeah. are those technologies? How can we use them? And so you go from you know, maybe wagging your finger in totally. the first instance to actually doing some joint problem solving using data. Completely, but I'm gonna like put a little, p poke them a little bit. I think they yeah. were conveniently unaware. No, and like the drumbeat of data and research, like you couldn't hide from it anymore. And so you have to engage now. And then not only like showing them where it is, they can't run away. And, and because of that, like, you know, someone asked, like, what makes me optimistic about COP? And, like, this announcement around methane does because it's this national commitment, right? There's all these levers we've got to pull, right? So on the wind policy politics side, you've got that thousand company commitment, right? Is that the meth, like, how many folks signed up to the 30 by 30? The 30, it's, a, it's over 100 countries. 100 countries, that's right. Over 100. So you've got yeah. that lever you're pulling. You've got the work that EDF is doing around satellites, so now you know where it is. On the technology side, well, the sad part is the parts to fix these things are very cheap to do, but you've got technology that can go fix it. Now the dollars have to flow to go after it, and so the companies themselves can choose to do it, but I can see a lot of countries going, hey, this is a problem that's important to us, we'll put some money behind it. And no, oh, no, it no. only costs us 10 million, 15 million to do it, like that's... I, I was yeah. very heartened yesterday, the, the President of South Korea talked about the fact that he was, as part of this pledge, putting money into into um, you know, regional development. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think the capital is going to come from yes, a number from will. a number of different directions. And of course, we have philanthropy stepping up as well. Yeah. The, the 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 methane pledge uh, that many philanthropists have made is also, I think, going to be incredibly helpful. So it, it's going it's going to take that. Sure, the philanthropic lever is the reason why yeah. a lot of the data, a lot of the re like like there's a fuel. And so that's the thing that I love, like. It's almost as, uh, you know, you, you could kind of blanket as a techie, we think the only thing that matters is the tech, and that is farthest from the truth. It's like we've got to pull all these levers, policy, investment, not just in tech, but in philanthropy, the innovation side, as well as the movements piece, if you want to get any of these things done. So you set a goal. Yep. You break <laughs> it down into constituent elements. Completely. You create, me you create ways to measure your progress, mm -hmm. and that's how you put all these various pieces together. The data, yes. the finance, yes, yes, yes. right? The, 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 the policy, it all it gets all, organized. It does, and I, you know, we, everyone here, to have come this far, to be in these rooms, like, you are the change makers, right? Like, the amount of effort and energy you have, I think the ask is, go for the gigatons. Right, go for the megatons, go for where you have so much leverage, we have so little time, and hence why we spend our time on methane, is because it's heating potential, we stop it now, it helps us, like it pays dividends of the, you know, in that sense. That's right. But in all the work that everyone here is doing, like just like take a re, like a, a recheck, like which one of these efforts are gonna have the most impact in the quickest time? And re, you know, rejuggle if you can. And then like set these kinds of targets and it's really, I think, going to push your teams to deliver the results, the results that we all want to see, which is, you know, reduced emissions. Well, Ryan, I have to say, okay, you know, these days here at COP can be very long. They, are very they start long. very <laughs> early in the morning and they last well into the evening and your energy sometimes can flag a little bit. And I think that we should at at the end of every day have a conversation with you. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, there's so many because, people here, which is like, I'm so your, thankful, yeah. Your, your energy, you know, is is so powerful and so infectious and uh, your passion for this oh, issue shines through. And the work that you and John have done in terms of giving us a way to think about how to solve this incredibly complicated problem, but really breaking it down into simple and actionable, it's, it's really, 
quite remarkable. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank, thank you, you. And thank you for being here at the Methane Pavilion. And Always. And giving us such a nice end to the day. Thank you. Oh, I must say, though, if anyone wants to get the plan, I, I, John would be like, Ryan, speedandscale.com. <laughs> but for anybody, the book does come out next week. So if you want uh, a preview of the action plan with those 10 objectives and 55 key results, right. if you just go to speedandscale.com, you'll be able to download one for free. And so we, I know we've got a bunch of books for folks here as well, too. So I'm excited that awesome. everyone's getting their hands on well, it. Well, again, thank thanks, you, thanks for being thank you, here. Thank you, thank you. All right. Okay.